But first, on Anzac Day, we honour everyone who's worn our uniform, and especially the 100,000 Australians who've died fighting for this country. We think of the Great War, when from a population of scarcely 5 million, more than 400,000 volunteered to serve overseas, and 60,000 of our sons never came home. On a personal note, I, I think today of my great-grandfather, who enlisted underage with his father's permission, because he wanted to join his five brothers already fighting overseas. I think of him, I also think of his mother, my great-great-grandmother, who without modern communications went months and months without a letter to know if any of her sons would return home. We think of the Second World War when from a population of scarcely 7 million, almost a million of us wore a uniform. And again, nearly 40,000 were killed in action or died in prison camps. I think here of my grandfather, wounded in a battle in New Guinea, that killed his best mate, and of his reluctance to ever really discuss war with us, his grandchildren. We think of all the post-war conflicts as well, including Korea, Vietnam, East Timor, and Afghanistan. In his Anzac address today in Canberra, Governor-General David Hurley, a former Defence Force chief who commanded the Australian contingent in Somalia 30 years ago, said this. He said that what had concerned his men most back then was not whether they'd get hurt, but could they live up to the example of their forefathers? Now, that's a good question. Would we live up to their example? Would we serve our country even unto death as so many of our parents and our grandparents did? And do we believe in our country enough to be ready to fight for it, especially to fight far away, as the Anzacs and Diggers did, for the values and ideals on which our country and all other free democracies depend. To the tens of thousands who march today, veterans and men and, William, men and women still wearing the uniform, well, their answer clearly is yes. They've done it and they're doing it still. And to the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions who attended dawn services and marches around the country, I suspect their answer is also yes. For the others, I wonder. These days we spend much time acknowledging country with the inference that it's the country of just 4% of us rather than the country of all of us. We spend much time, don't we, angsting over the past and some wanting to rewrite history. We spend much time fretting about toxic masculinity, even though re reality is that we've relied on strong men to keep us safe in the past and we will do so into the future. But despite all of this, most of us still know that in terms of freedom, justice and a fair go, Australia remains the best country on earth, and that, of course, means it's worth defending. Well, that's just as well, isn't it? Because it's many decades since the wider world has been as dangerous as it is now. And as we saw yesterday in the release of the government's Defence Strategic Review on Anzac Day, things ahead are tough. There were some important messages in the document that we can't count on 10 years' notice of any major conflict, that China's militarisation of the South China Sea is a direct threat to Australia's national security, that our armed forces need to be able to defeat any adversary, China included, seeking to attack Australia, and that most worryingly, that we're currently not ready for an armed conflict on any serious scale. But it seems that the review, as usual, dances around some of the really important issues. As just about every defence analyst today has said, Communist China is preparing to attack Taiwan. The Beijing government repeatedly and openly declares its ambition to be the world's top power by mid-century, and that its next step in overcoming what Beijing sees as its century of humiliation is taking Taiwan by force if necessary. Democratic Taiwan is never going to submit to communist rule. That means that a Chinese assault on Taiwan is all but inevitable. Here is defence expert Dr Malcolm Davis on this point on my program last night. We are facing the prospect of war with China potentially as early as the second half of this decade. We mm -hmm. are orientating this country in anticipation of the potential risk of a war with China in the second half of this decade. All but inevitable, unless, unless the democracies led by America, but including Australia, 
make it clear to Beijing that any assault on Taiwan won't just be giant China up against tiny Taiwan, but will be China versus the free world. Now, that's the only way to raise the stakes enough to deter Beijing, deterrence through strength. Because make no mistake, anything other than status quo would be a catastrophe. A successful Chinese assault on Taiwan, unresisted by the democracies, would upend the world order as we know it, as countries either arm themselves to the teeth against Beijing or roll over and make the best accommodation they can with the communist superpower. But helping Taiwan risks a war between the superpowers, with all that entails in terms of sending the world back towards the Stone Age. There's not much in this review, at least in the unclassified version, about how Australia might help to maintain peace across the Taiwan Straits, because believe me, America will expect our help. But what there is in this review is yet more reviews. A further review into how we might maintain our fuel security, given we scarcely have more than a few weeks of fuel reserves. Another review, a further review into the surface fleet due later this year. There's plenty of talk too about more missiles, but again, no hard dates or clear path for their acquisition. And no missile defence systems, even though military bases in this country could easily be a target. In fact, the only specific commitment so far to come out of this review was to scrap the acquisition of most of the new infantry fighting vehicles for the army and not to go ahead with the purchase of more self-propelled artillery. Even though the lesson of history is to expect the unexpected. And there's no reason to think that Australia could never again be called upon to help in a major land war in Europe or in the Middle East, a, a new terrorism fight, for example, as we have been so often in the past. And there's no new spending, none, at least over the current forward estimates, despite the real risk of war in our region within just a couple of years, as you just heard from Malcolm Davis. Naturally, there's pages and pages in this review on climate change, which the review says is amplifying our challenges. Now, seriously, with China building over a 1,000 new coal-fired power stations and on the biggest armament build-up in its history, I bet their army isn't as focused on climate change as ours seems to be. On AUKUS, I want to give the government the benefit of the doubt that we will actually get nuclear-powered submarines rather than just talk about acquiring them. But so far, like its predecessor, this government is better at delivering words than actual military capability. For the most part, the plans are good, but there's no real urgency at putting them into practice. That's one thing that's really got to change. The other thing that really needs to change now, of course, is how we think about ourselves. Now, we can't honour Australia and Australians on Anzac Day and then spend the rest of the year denigrating our country and ourselves. If it wasn't for the men that are, today our culture routinely wants to drag down, we wouldn't be where we are now in 2023, free and democratic. Now, I know you watching this program know all of that, but it's time the rest of the country did too.